Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to the Bethesda Temple School of Knowledge. We bless God for each and every one of you and for our gathering this evening. Let's go before the Lord with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your tender mercy and your grace that you bestow upon us so wonderfully. We appreciate you and we thank you for this day. It is the day that you've made that we will rejoice. We will be glad in it. Prepare our hearts, our minds now to receive your word. Help us to process it and then to apply it to our lives that we might be blessed through it. Bless those who are gathering and those who will come uh, during the course of this study. Bless us all as we study your word together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Minister Brian George is coming with his first selection, and then I'll be back with this evening's lesson. You don't have to worry, and don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning, troubles they don't last always, for there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away, and if your heart is broken, just lift your hand and say, Oh, I know that I can make it. I know. series Better Living Through God's Word. This is the fifth session of this series. The Bible is a holistic guide to living life successfully. Indeed, it teaches us the way to salvation and spiritual principles for pleasing God and for building a relationship with Him. The Bible reveals the past, the present, and the future of mankind. But the Bible also teaches us how to live our best lives and to experience and enjoy success in this life. That fact is more than hinted at in the verse that forms our scriptural anchor for this series. That is, of course, 
Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8, where God himself says to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, because the Bible teaches a holistic approach to successful living, we will, and we have in this series, examined spiritual answers and principles for real life issues. We're considering the quality of our lives rather than simply the quantity of things that we may accrue in this life. The Word of God teaches us to successfully navigate through the troubles and problems that commonly and not so commonly occur in life. So the goal of this series is to show us how we can live satisfying lives by applying biblical principles as our guide. Now in this session this evening, we're going to examine God's word for anxiety. Given the climate of the times, considering what is going on around us, the recent election and its implications, racial unrest, police brutality, blue on black crime, the pandemic and all of uh, the woes and troubles that come with the pandemic, it is not surprising that people are anxious and that anxiety is becoming pervasive even among the people of God. Let me take a moment to uh, define or better yet describe this phenomenon that we call anxiety. Anxiety is an anticipatory tension. It is a vague dread persisting in the absence of a specific threat. Now, anxiety is not fear. In fact, it's more insidious than fear. I say that because fear occurs in the presence of a real threat. Anxiety, on the other hand, generally occurs without any identifiable stimulus. It is negative thought taken to the extreme. Anxiety can and does affect every part of our being negatively. Anxiety can affect one cognitively. It colors the way that we think. It can influence individuals somatically. It has a negative impact on the body and how it functions. Anxiety can control people emotionally. It gets down into the heart and affects the very way that people feel. And anxiety can even govern behavior. It will direct what we do. All of these aspects of our nature, of our lives, can be negatively impacted by this thing called anxiety. But that is no way for a child of God to live. Proverbs 12, 25 says, and I'm reading from the New International Version, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Now, did you hear that first part? An anxious heart, a heart filled with anxiety, weighs a man down. But I'm endeavoring to give someone a kind word this evening, an answer for your anxiety. Psalm 127 verses 1 and 2, I believe, speak specifically to anxiety. I want you to listen to them, and uh, I'm going to read them from the New Living Translation. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. 
unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Listen to how the King James Version renders that second verse. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Notice what the writer says and how poetic uh, the translators put it in the King James Version, to eat the bread of sorrows. That is what anxiety is. It is the bread of sorrows. But look at what God does for us. He gives rest to his loved ones, or as the King James Version puts it, he giveth his beloved sleep. He allows us to rest in him. But let me ask you a question. What can or what does anxiety do for you? What does anxiety do? How does anxiety help you in your day-to-day -day living? I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 27. He said, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Very interesting question, which the New International Version actually renders more accurately from the original Greek. There it says in the NIV, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? I want you to think about that. How does worrying add anything to your life? It cannot extend it even an hour. Worry exact, actually tends to do the opposite, I believe. It shaves off time from us rather than adding on an hour or more to our lives. God does not want this for his children. So what is the main source of anxiety? While many threats, problems may come and go, the main source of anxiety is rooted in the day-to-day -day issues that face us. How are we going to make it through this day? What are we going to eat? How are we going to pay the bills? And this is why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31 through 34, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Let me stop there for a moment because I don't want to run past that. God already knows what your needs are. As a matter of fact, before the need arose, God knew the need and has already made the way. As a matter of fact, that is the whole concept of provision. God provides for us. The word provide comes from the Latin providere, which literally means to see beforehand. What I'm saying to you is, God sees your need before your need ever comes your way. Not only has he seen your need, but he has already met the need or given you the way to meet the need. So let me go further in, this, um, in the words of Christ in Matthew 6. Verse 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble for its own. Anxiety borrows from 
or trades in the possibility of future troubles. But we have to remember that God has promised to give us all that we need and then some. Jesus said to us in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Again, I like the way the New Living Translation renders that verse. It says, so don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. God takes joy in blessing his people. God takes delight in meeting the needs of his children. And since he delights in giving us things that we need, we need not worry about what we do not have. What we need to do is trust that God will indeed provide. David expressed his trust or his faith in God's provision like this. In Psalm 37, verse 35, 25, David said, I have been young, now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He said, I've lived a long life, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken by God, and I've not seen the children of the righteous begging bread. Paul expressed his faith in God's provision like this. You find these words in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And again, I'm using the New Living Translation. Now, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God is able to do whatever we need him to do whenever we need him to do whatever we need him to do. God is able to meet whatever need you have whenever you need him to meet whatever need you have. And as I've often said, and some on top of that. This is the kind of God we serve. A God who is abundantly able. Not only is he abundantly able to meet our needs, but he has an abundant supply with which to meet our needs. This is the God we serve. And he, as he said, takes delight, takes pleasure in blessing his children. Now, Allow me for a moment to use the two men I just cited as examples of how anxiety should be addressed. And let me say this, anxiety should not be ignored. We need to deal with our anxieties. The two men I'm referring to face trouble, trial, and anxiety often, but they got a grip on it and on themselves. Let's for a moment look at David. Even though David suffered severe anxiety at times, he kept learning and relearning that trusting in God to provide for his needs and to deliver him from difficulties would resolve his problems. No matter how big the problem is, God can solve it. This is why David said in Psalm 34, beginning in verse 4, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a God. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. God again shows that he meets our need. Now, let's also consider Paul. And let me say this at this juncture. I'm so glad that the Bible not only shows the 
great exploits of our biblical heroes or those that we look to in the Bible as great men and women of God, uh, but it also shows their fears. It shows their failures. And they are quick to admit their failures, their fears, their lack, as Paul does uh, even in 2 Corinthians 1 and 8. Paul understood that God is the only true source of help. Paul faced many anxiety-inducing situations in his ministry and in his travels, but he consistently trusted that God would provide deliverance from those situations that were beyond his control. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 8, and I'll read down through verse 10, Paul shares one of those situations that he was not able to handle himself. In verse 8, he says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. That's what God does on a regular basis. He rescues, he delivers, and he takes us through. And I personally believe that God allows such circumstances to come upon us in order to teach us to stop relying on ourselves and to start relying on him. He allows circumstances to come upon us that we cannot handle by ourselves so that we will learn to repair to him. Not only to repair to him, but to put our trust in him. There are times when mother can't do it, father can't do it, pastor can't do it, church mother can't do it, deacons can't do it, husband can't do it, wife can't do it. You've got to go to God. He alone is able, but there is nothing that God is not able to do. So, as I'm getting ready to wind this up, let's talk about how we should deal with or handle our anxiety because it is real we do experience it but we have a key or three keys actually we have a way to rid ourselves of that anxiety so i'm going to share with you three things you can do to relieve you from the burden that anxiety brings the first thing is this fix your thoughts on God. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Isaiah said in effect, focus your thoughts on God and not so much on your problem. Perhaps we should take the time from time to time to read about how God has blessed, how God has healed, and how God has delivered others in the scripture. Or perhaps along with that, we can talk to others who have been through what we are going through, but came through it by the help of the Lord. These things will help us to learn to lean and depend upon God. It will help us, they'll help us to trust him for guidance and for direction. The result then becomes perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. You will keep in perfect peace 
all who trust you, all whose thoughts are fixed upon you. Now, if you ever look at that from the Hebrew, you find that there is no perfect there. There's no word that indicates perfect in the Hebrew. As a matter of fact, what you will see is shalom, shalom. That's what he really said. You will keep him in shalom, shalom. Peace, peace. Now, I told you before that shalom is a comprehensive term that encompasses five different things. Tranquility, prosperity, health, well-being, and safety. Now, so he says you experience shalom, shalom. This is not a doubling of these things, but rather you have an exponential experience of his peace, of his providence, of his healing virtue and his ability to keep you healthy even in the midst of a pandemic. You'll have an exponential experience of his protection and how he's able to keep you safe. You'll have an exponential experience of how he blesses your well-being so that you feel whole, that you feel confident and that you feel competent. Everything you need is provided by him as you fix and focus your mind on God and upon his will. Now, the first key, fix your thoughts on God. The second key is found uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul shares with us uh, the how of learning to fix our minds upon the Lord and depend upon him when he says this, and again, reading from the New Living Translation, where it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I love the way that's put. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, in the King James Version, you see the words prayer and supplication. Prayer is petition in the widest sense. It's petition in general, but supplication denotes particular and specific requests. So in our general prayer, we pray for the peace of the world. In our general prayer, we pray for our leaders. In our general prayer, we pray for a blessing upon the city and as he directs our, prayer, our, our steps. But in supplication, we ask him for those specific needs that we have, especially those needs that tend to cause us to become anxious or worried. Prayer is one of the greatest adjuncts that God has given us, but sadly, it is also one of the most neglected. We don't spend enough time in prayer. We don't spend a whole lot of time in prayer. Uh, many of us don't have a secret closet in which to go. And okay, maybe you don't. But we need to be spending time with God in prayer. Not always talking. Sometimes we need to spend time just listening to him. Prayer is a form of communication. Communication is an exchange by at least two parties. So if we're doing all the talking all the time, then we're not really praying. We are simply petitioning. Sometimes we need to just be quiet and listen to him. But we should take advantage of the adjunct of prayer. As a matter of fact, Joseph Scriven took pen in hand and began to write these words 
as a challenge, as an encouragement, and perhaps even as a rebuke. He said, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs, anxieties to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. But then he went on to write, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And what you may think is too small for God to deal with, God will deal with. God is concerned with what Ever you are concerned about. This is why Paul said, uh, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. But Paul was not finished with prayer. He said, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. The word thanksgiving is the translation of the Greek word eucharistia. Eucharistia means active, grateful language to God as an act of worship. What are you saying, Hi? I'm saying what Paul was saying is add some praise to your prayer. Put some acclamation to your asking. Insert a little recognition in your request. Remember, we're in a praise pandemic. So I'm reminding you, take some time to give God some praise. I've asked you for uh, 30 days from the 8th of November, but if you're starting today, then 30 days from this day, at least 60 seconds of unrestrained praise unto God. In that time of praise, you petition him for nothing during that praise time, but you just give God the glory, the honor, and the praise. I found out 60 seconds is not enough for me. I don't know about you, but it just goes by too fast. The reason I said 60 seconds is to give those who are not given to praise much a goal to shoot for. But the thing about it is, once you get started, it's hard to cut it off at 60, and you shouldn't cut it off at 60. Just keep going until you stop. But every day for the next 30 days, give God some praise. Now, if you're not willing to add praise to your prayer and your supplication, you just may have to hang on to your anxieties. But I promise you, there is something about praise. As a matter of fact, I was telling someone the other day, praise has a physiological effect as well as a psychological effect. The physiological effect is that praise releases endorphins into your system. And those endorphins make your body feel good. So when you have a good time praising God and your body reacts to it, feels good, it is because you have released those endorphins into your system and it just makes you feel a whole lot better. So we fix our minds on God. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We pray as well as praise. And finally, the third key or the third thing that we need to do in order to get rid of our anxieties is to give them to God. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter 5 and 7, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. The King James Version renders that casting all your care upon him for he cared for you. Now, every time I think of that verse, something comes to mind. It is not exegesis. It is not a proper translation. But I believe it's exactly what God does. When I cast my cares upon him, he does the caring for me. 
what Peter did was you can cast your cares upon him because he loves you. But what I continue to hear in my spirit is when I cast my cares upon him, when I give them to him, then he takes care of my cares. He cares for me. The word that Peter used for casting um, or to give, as in the New Living Translation, was a strong word. It's epiripto from the Greek, and it means literally to throw upon. Peter was saying, bring them all at once. Bundle all your worries, all your cares up, and throw them upon the Lord. You can do this because he is concerned with your concerns. So, as we fix our minds on Jesus, we come to the conclusion that he can handle our problems. When we arrive at that conclusion, we can simply cast those problems on the Lord. And as we cast those problems on the Lord, we should give him thanks. We should thank him for the victory. We should thank him for deliverance. We should thank him for the blessing, but we should also thank him for bearing our burdens. We should thank him for taking our concerns. And when we do these things, when we fix our minds on Jesus, when we trust in him and uh, pray, casting our burdens upon him, the peace of God then pervades and keeps our hearts. And when we do these things, the peace of God will guard our minds. And when we do these things, these keys, the peace of God will pervade in our circumstances and chase away our anxieties. So I want to do something today. We know that God wants to help us deal with the anxieties in our lives. He wants us to bring our doubts, our worries, our fears to him. So let's try something this evening. Get a pen and a piece of paper right now. I know that the Apostle Peter encouraged us to bundle all of our anxiety-causing issues together and cast them all at once upon God. But perhaps our trust level isn't quite there yet. So try this. Write down at least one thing that you are anxious or worried about right now and prepare to turn it over to God. Get a pencil, a pen, a piece of paper and write down one thing that worries you, one thing that makes you anxious. And what we're going to do is we're going to give it to God right now. We're going to ask God to help you start dealing with your anxieties more effectively by trusting him and committing yourself to his will. Now, when we give these anxieties to God, you must not take them back. Fight the temptation to go and take them back. We used to say it something like this, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Don't go back and get them again. Are you writing? Because we're getting ready to pray about these worries. We're going to cast them upon God now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you for those who have written or in the process of writing right now concerning their burdens, that thing, the main thing that causes them worry, that gives them anxiety. Help them, Master, to release it to you right now, to turn it over to you, because we know that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask and above all that we think. We know that you can do for us what no other power can do, and we believe you today. And so we're turning this over. We release this worry. We release this anxiety. We release this fear to you. And we commit now to giving it to you and leaving it there 
We commit now to trusting you to do for us what only you can do. And we commit now to doing your will more strenuously. And we thank you for these favors. We thank you for the blessing. We thank you for the relief that we feel right now as we have turned this thing or these things over to you. Work them out according to your will. Work them out according to your wisdom. Work them out according to your power and your desire. And we thank you for it even now in Jesus' name. Now give him the praise right where you are. Bless him right where you are. Going forward, I want you to do this every day until all your cares have been given to him. Write them down, offer them up, and leave them alone. Do it every day until you have no more care, till you have no more anxieties. You can and you will experience the tangible benefits of God's involvement in your life and in your circumstances. Those benefits are peace of mind, prosperity, better health, safety, and total well-being. In other words, living your best life. Brian's coming with his final selection, and then I'll be back to take any questions that you might have. I will keep you in perfect peace. All whose mind is stayed on me. She asks, 
Can anxiety affect you physically and lead to depression? Can anxiety affect you physically and lead to depression? Uh, Sister Loretta, those are actually two separate questions and the answer to both is yes. Uh, anxiety can affect you and negatively impact you physiologically. Your body negatively reacts to anxiety and to worry. And if you allow anxiety to take over your mind, your heart, your spirit, it can indeed lead to depression. This is why Peter so urgently says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God wants you to experience his well-being, Sister Loretta, so we have to give those anxieties to him as quickly as possible. I hope that helps. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Next Pastor one. Mona Phillips asks, does taking it back mean you don't pray about it anymore? Explain. Um, taking it back means that you have taken it upon yourself. Um, giving God your care does not necessarily mean you do not pray about it anymore. Um, let me give you a biblical example because Jesus tells us that we are always to pray and not to faint. In the 18th chapter of the gospel according to Luke, uh, Jesus tells the story of what we call the importunate widow who went daily to the judge insisting that he avenge her of her adversary, that he would act as her avenger. It got to the point where the judge told the widow, I don't fear God and I don't fear man, but lest by your continual, continual coming, you worry me or weary me, I'm going to do what you said. And so uh, Jesus said, it is the same with the saints. Um, we continue to pray, though God may seem to tarry long. But Jesus also asked this question in your praying. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So when you continue to pray about it, pray in faith. And again, Pastor Mona, add some praise to that prayer. You petitioned him, now praise him for the answer. I don't see it yet, but I know it's coming, so Lord, I thank you. I hope that helps, Pastor Phillips. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. yes. Brother, all right, next question. Brother John Goodlow. Brother John Goodlow. Oh, well, before you ask that, shout out to my family. I told them I was gonna shout out to them tonight. Brother Goodlow, what's your question? Brother Goodlow says, why do I sometimes feel guilty when I cast my cares on him a lot. I don't know. Maybe you don't feel worthy of casting your cares on him. So let me free you from that right now. Brother Goodloe, none of us are worthy, mm -hmm. but it's not about worship or worthiness. It's about the fact that God loves us. He wants you to bring all your burdens and all your cares to him. Now, uh, I don't know if it's your flesh or if it's the adversary whispering in your ear, oh, here you come again. Don't worry about it. God is happy to see you anytime you come to him and bring your needs. So just keep on praying and forget about the guilt. As a matter of fact, praise the guilt away. Next question. That's it. That's it. Well, God bless you all. I hope this lesson has helped you. But we're going to cast our cares daily upon the Lord so that we can experience the peace of God that passes understanding. Did you see something else? I did. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go right. ahead. Uh, Sister Antoinette Green Tubbs asks, what else can we do to fight the temptation 
to not take our cares back after giving them to God? That's the first question. Okay, well, let's start with that first question. The main thing to do is praise him for taking it. Praise him anytime um, you feel like you're about to worry afresh over something you have given to God, praise him for doing it. Praise him for taking it from you and ask him to take away the worry or the anxiety as you replace it with praise. What's the next part of the question or the next question? If it's still on our mind, have we taken it back? I don't think that you've taken it back because it's still on your mind. Um, we, we are creatures of habit. And so these things are going to come back to us. But if we find ourselves back in the same place, back at square one where we are worried or anxious about this thing, then the thing to do is not even try to discern whether or not we've taken it back, just give it to God again. That's all. Father, take this from me again. I'm thinking about it too much. Take it from me and let me just give you the praise and the glory because I know you're going to handle it. You may not handle it in the time that I want you to handle it, but I know in good time you will. And I also know that I'm learning from this and I'm going to grow through this. Some time ago, I challenged all of the membership of this house to no longer simply go through things, but rather to grow through things. So look at all of these things as opportunities, not problems, but opportunities to grow in your level of faith and trust in your father. I hope that helps. All right. Okay, that's it? No. Okay, next question. This, this is a three-part question. Oh, it's a three-part question. Okay. All righty then. No, this is totally different, okay? All right. Oh, so this is totally different. Uh, Y'all, you have confused Deacon Williams. I just want you to know. <laughs> All right. All right. What's the third question? Sister Rhonda Minifield, she asks, first, how can you be sure that you are trusting God? How can you be sure that you are trusting God? You grow in it. Um, and I, I, I do differentiate between faith and trust. Faith is um, intellectual. Faith is an assent to the truth of God's word, but trust is relational. Um, and to grow in trust or to be sure that you trust God, you have to continue to grow and strengthen your relationship with him. So how can you know whether you trust him? Examine your relationship with God. Because I guarantee you, the more you get to know him and the more you relate to him, the more trustworthy you find him. I hope that helps. I think you actually answered all three in one. But I did. One, the second one was, are trust and faith the same? And you answered that. Okay. All right. And then the third one was, how do you practice trust? Grow in your relationship. That's it. Um, you simply grow with him. There are times when God will tell you what he's going to do, and God will tell you what he will not do do. Sometimes those are the toughest things to hear from God, but you have to trust then that he knows what is best for you and that he is looking out for your best, not just right now, but he knows what is ahead for you. So he knows what is in your future. This is when you have to trust not just yourself, but your entire future in the hands of of our God who is already there in your future working things out. I hope that helps. That's it. Okay. All right. So remember, dear hearts, saints of God, that uh, we will be on Facebook Sunday at 11. We will not have parking lot praise and worship. I think we're pretty much done for the year with parking lot praise and worship. However, 1230, 
Sunday afternoon, 1230. Meet me in the parking lot if you want. We're going to have a general prayer like we used to before we started having full-blown uh, parking lot praise and worship services. So after the service, after we conclude and after we have our concluding prayer, get in your car, join us on the campus at 12.30 p.m. And we're going to have our parking lot prayer, going to place a blessing on you in Jesus' name and let you go about your day. All right, so we hope to see you at 12.30 on Sunday. If all hearts and minds are clear, let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for helping us to live our best lives, which means that we walk in your light and that we have fellowship with you and fellowship with each other. It means that you take care of our cares you carry our burdens and you help us along this way to live and experience success and blessing in this life. Thank you for all of these favors. Thank you for your children and I pray a special blessing upon each and every one who has tuned in. Do what they need you to do. Be all that they need you to be and bless them until we meet again. We will be mindful to give you the praise, the glory, the honor that's due you. We ask these favors in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Till next time, keep looking up.